Welcome to Morningstar Fellowship Online. We are so glad you've joined us for this week's message. We encourage you to come join us in person for our live worship experience every Sunday at 9 and 11 a.m. at either our Quakertown or Pennsburg campuses. You can head over to www.mstarqtown.org for more information. Again, thanks for listening, and here's this week's message. Oh, we're doing good, aren't we? Yeah, we're together, we're in God's house, we're doing very good, and it's hard to believe as we look at celebrating 20 years of Morning Star Fellowship, the goodness of God, the faithfulness of God, and we're celebrating just that very fact, October 6th in the Sunday service. I want you to be here, invite somebody to be with you. You're going to hear a lot more of the special things we have planned as we just say, man, God is great, God still is good, Amen. He hasn't changed. How many's noticed our world is changing rapidly? Not for the better, but our God is not changing, and our call and our mission hasn't changed. And so we're going to stay on point. We're going to keep believing Jesus, preaching Jesus, keep seeing lives change for the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I'm going to bring this out in the message today, but we started in the, the little building, outgrew that, built all this. We've been in here about 12 years, and... Um, our Build for Life campaign was Build for Life, and life is the acronym for living in freedom every day. God's called us to live in freedom every day, amen? And that's what we're looking at in Scripture, the miracles of Jesus. That's the series that we're in, and we use that word miracle very loosely in everyday life, and you know, there are those Sports miracles. We call them sports miracles. How about 1980, the miracle on ice? The U.S. Olympic team and the hockey team, uh, they were collegiate players. They beat the Soviet Union, who were professionals, to win the gold. Sports miracle. How many remember that? Yeah. How about the Philadelphia Eagles? beating Tom Brady and the New England Patriots. Super Bowl 52, February 4th, 2018, with the Philly Special. Some call that a sports miracle. Some of us remember the Miracle Mets, 1969, the worst team of the decade. They beat the Baltimore Orioles, the Miracle Mets. Or how about the 1936 Olympic rowing team, the men's rowing team from the University of Washington. You may have seen that excellent movie, Boys in the Boat, and they beat, man, did they just come from behind, and they beat Italy, they beat Germany to win the gold. Yeah, Boys in the Boat. And then there's, how about miracle survivors? I looked at this. There was a baby survived 12 hours in the morgue because they thought the baby was stillborn. The baby survived. A Polish railway worker, he survived 19 years in a coma from 1998, and he woke up April 12, 2007. A skyscraper window washer falls from the 47th floor. 16 surgeries later, and after two years, he's fully recovered. We would call these miracles, miracle survivor. Well, what about the miracles of Jesus? Jesus, the miracle worker, and I like to say it this way, he brings his super to our natural, and so we can experience the supernatural. I want you to think about it. You know, it's summertime, so we have less of a crowd here today, but we're here today. How many people are here today? All right. I'm glad you're with me. All right. You're not here by chance, coincident, or accident. I believe God planned for you to be here today. God's got something for us this morning. Let's stand together, if you would, take our Bibles, and let's just uh, believe God's Word. He's going to challenge us. He's going to grow us as we open the Word. We're going to meet with Him this morning. So let's say it together together. Uh, 
just in faith. This is my Bible. This is the Word of God. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. When I read and hear the word, faith comes to my spirit. I boldly confess my mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God, and it will change my life. I'll never be the same again in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You sound great this morning. Mark chapter 5. We're going to look at verse 21 through 43. And what we see happening this morning is Jairus, a ruler of the synagogue, and his sick daughter on the verge of death, and a woman suffering with an illness for 12 long years. So it's two true stories in one. And we're going to get right into it. We're looking at Jesus the healer. So first of all, we're going to look at a desperate man, a desperate man. Verse 21, 22, and 23, break this down and just go right through this true story and see how it applies to us this morning. What can we take away? What can we receive? What can change in our lives? And it says, Jesus got into the boat again, went back to the other side of the lake, the Lake of Galilee, Sea of Galilee, where a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. Then a leader of the local synagogue, whose name was Jairus, arrived, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, pleading fervently with him, my little daughter is dying, he said. Please come and lay your hands on her. Heal her so she can live. We look at this. And so what's taking place? And I wonder if the disciples were afraid to get back in the boat again. Because what we've been looking at now, this is the third week in a row, all of these events have happened in succession. Several weeks ago, I talked about the storm. They're on Lake Galilee, and Jesus calls the storm, and he has authority over nature. And then last week, the Pastor Jonathan, our discipleship pastor, he spoke about Jesus as authority over Satan and, and, and demons. And then we see it takes place again. They get back in the boat. And the last time, they were in that violent storm. They almost sank. And, 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 but now, the weather is fair, and it's calm, and it's peaceful. And, and life can be like that sometimes. Man, we can be in a storm, and, and then it just changes. And life is calm. Life is peaceful. It's all quiet. And if the disciples have been hoping for a little quiet time, a little time off, well, not yet. And at this point in their journey with Jesus, it was an exciting journey. They didn't know what was coming next. It was one big adventure with Jesus. Every day, even during that day, things changed rapidly. So here they are. They're on the outskirts of Capernaum. They went back across the lake. And about 10 years ago, I was at Capernaum. This is the new hometown of Jesus. He made his headquarters there, his ministry headquarters there in Capernaum. And so we can take a look at that pic, if you've got that pic of Capernaum. And they even have placed a sign there for today that the hometown of Jesus. And so maybe we're not having that. So we don't have that. They're shaking their head at me. All righty. And so sometimes life goes smoothly, sometimes not so smoothly. <laughs> but if you could see the picture... <laughs> So the hometown of Jesus makes his headquarters. This is where uh, Peter, James, and John, they're from. And then, you know, what we're going to just mention in a moment, but, you know, here's where uh, Peter's house was, and he lived with his wife and his mother-in-law. And, and the, I was there, and they even have the foundation in the exact place where they believe Peter lived and the miracle that took place there. So what we see is... Who is Jairus? He's a ruler of the local synagogue. He's a ruler of the local synagogue. Well, what's the synagogue? It's where Jewish congregation would meet for worship, instruction, education, and learning. And he was responsible for supervising the worship services, running the weekly school. He was caring for the building. And, and these leaders of the synagogue... They had close ties with the Pharisees. And how many remember the Pharisees didn't like Jesus so much on the most part? Yeah. And the belief is that these rulers, including Jairus, 
we're, we're, we're persuaded not to support Jesus. But Jairus had been present. If you go back to Mark chapter 1, when right there in the synagogue, Jesus, Jesus delivered a demon-possessed man right there in the synagogue. Jared, Jairus was present. He was present for Jesus' healing on the Sabbath, also in Mark chapter 1. Jairus knew about the paralytic man that had friends, and they let him down through the roof to Jesus, and Jesus healed the paralyzed man, and he got up and he walked. He knew all about the criticism against Jesus, that he claimed to forgive sins and only God could forgive sins, and that he healed on the Sabbath, and that he knew that what was being said about Jesus, that, you know, he isn't doing things according to our Jewish law. The religious leader said that. Jesus is a rogue rabbi. Watch out for this man called Jesus. And so I wonder, was Jairus on the fence concerning Jesus? Well, he may have been, but he was a desperate dad. Desperation will lead you to a lot of things. It really will. He loved his daughter, daddy's little girl. How many fathers here today you have a daughter? Yeah, keep your hand raised. Daddy's little girl. You do anything for your little girl. No matter what age she is, you'll do anything for your little girl. Uh, we didn't have daughters. We had two sons. We have granddaughters now. Yeah. Yeah. He was driven by desperation and that need took him all the way to Jesus. And Jairus is only uh, one uh, of a handful of miracle recipients. He's named in the Gospels by name. And we think, well, why? And some think that, well, he probably went on to be a prominent part of the early church. His daughter may have shared her testimony with anybody everywhere. She became famous, so to speak. Well, what do we know about Jairus? He came to Jesus with great humility and faith. And those are two key components right there. He came to Jesus with great humility and faith. And he falls at Jesus' feet and he makes a request of Jesus that really no one else had ever made. Will you come to my house and lay hands on my daughter and heal my daughter? Will you come to my house and lay hands on my daughter and heal my daughter? And, and he may have been familiar with this because Peter lived in Capernaum. Peter's mother-in-law was healed in his house. Jesus shows up and heals Peter's mother-in-law. And Peter had a little problem with that. He couldn't get over that. He wasn't quite so excited as he was when he was walking on what? Nobody got that this morning. He said, what in the world are you doing here, Jesus? <laughs> But he lays hands on Peter's mother-in-law, and she is healed. And so Jairus was familiar with that. He was familiar with Jesus touching the leper. You know, the Word of God tells us itself that Jesus did so many things that all the books in the world could not record and hold what he did. And so there's probably so much more, and Jairus was already familiar with this. And the key in all this is that Jairus had faith. He had faith to believe that Jesus, what he did for others, he would do for him and his dying daughter. He had no doubt that if Jesus would only come, if you'll only come, Jesus, my little girl will be healed. So I have a question for us this morning. How desperate are we? How desperate are you for the Lord's help in your life? How desperate are we? And then secondly, we see a desperate woman, verse 24. Jesus went with him. All the people followed, crowding around him. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors. And over the years, she had spent everything she had to pay them, but she had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd. So what do we see happening here? Jairus, a ruler of the synagogue, pleaded with Jesus to respond to him, come home, heal my dying daughter. Jesus responds to his emergency call, and this qualifies as an emergency, a 9-11 call to Jesus. He's on his way. He's going to Jairus' house. He answers the call, but there's impediment. There's a traffic jam, not with automobiles, of course, with people. 
In front and back, all around, he's circled by a crowd, a multitude. He is being pressed and touched on every side. And you talk about personal space and you have your own little bubble. How many likes your personal space in your little bubble? You ever been with somebody and they're a close talker right there? And you back up and they back up and you back up and they back up. You know, he didn't have any personal space. He didn't have a bubble that day. There was a crowd and a multitude around him touching him. And it was loud on all sides, everywhere, pressing in on Jesus. And they were crying out to him. But Jairus was in a hurry. He had to get home. His daughter was dying and everything was moving in slow motion. It's like, hurry up, let's go, come on. And how many's ever been in a hurry and you've been in a real traffic jam and you just are sitting there going nowhere? Yeah, fun times, right? Yeah, that, that, that's when you, you really have to exercise your Christianity. It's time to worship the Lord and pray. You're not yelling at the car beside you, in front of you, or what's, you know, you know really. And, and this is Jairus. We have to go, Jesus, come on. And they're stuck in the crowd. And then Mark, the author of this, human author, he zooms in on one woman in the crowd. And he begins to tell us about this woman. And she was in great distress. And we will learn later in the story that Jairus' daughter was 12 years of age. And this woman, we could say, was living in a parallel universe, and she had been suffering for 12 years. The little girl was growing up in a privileged home, and this desperate woman was growing and living, I should say, in isolation for 12 years. She had this incurable condition. She had a continual 12-year-long menstrual cycle, which means that she bled constantly, and that made her unclean ritually in Judaism. Leviticus 15, Leviticus 15, 25 through 27 tells us this. This made her a social outcast. She couldn't be with people, around people. She couldn't go to the synagogue to worship. She desperately wanted Jesus to heal her. It had been 12 long years of hope and then disappointment. I go to a doctor, he tells me to do this. I go to another doctor, he tells me, no, don't do that, do this. He doesn't work, and this doesn't work. And now, don't do this any longer, won't you try this? And nothing seems to work. She is suffering ups and downs, highs and lows. And I believe she's at her lowest point right now. And she's thinking, how much longer can I go on living in isolation? I've lost my identity. I have lost my destiny. I have lost my family. I have lost my friends. I have lost everything. I have lost my health. I have lost my wealth. I have no hope. I'm living in isolation. And people are people. They probably blamed her. You know what? There must be sin in your life somewhere. Well, you probably don't have enough faith. If you just had faith, you wouldn't be in that condition. Her life savings had been exhausted on medical care, and and she'd only grown worse. Dr. Luke himself, in his book, chapter 8, Luke, verse 35, says it this way, no one could heal her. She had lost her wealth, her health. She was desperate making her way through the crowd, getting closer and closer and sidestepping and sidestepping and squeezing and weaving. And I believe she got on her hands and knees and even crawled. And then she comes up and there he is. I'm right behind Jesus. I've made my way to him. And I call this a divine interruption. She seems to be defeated, about ready to throw in the towel, to give up on life. There's no hope. I'm never going to get better. It's been 12 long years. But I heard about this Jesus. Jesus. Isn't that a great name right there? Don't you feel good when you say the name of Jesus? Let's say it together. One, two, three. Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. She says, I've heard about this Jesus, and I'm going to try one more time. 
with Jesus. Say it with me one more time. One more time. I'm just going to try it one more time with Jesus. So what can we learn from our example? This is it. No matter how many setbacks you have experienced, and she suffered a lot of setbacks, and you may have been through some setbacks and disappointments. Never give up. Never give in. Jesus is passing your way right now. You're not here by accidents. It's not a coincidence. Never give up. Never give in. Your setback is a setup for your comeback. Let it begin today in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Never give up, never give in. Then we see a healing touch, verse 27, the second part of that through 29. And touched his robe, for she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, this was the tassel, the fringe of his prayer shawl. If I could just touch Jesus, I will be healed. Immediately, the the bleeding stopped, and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. And this was a definite no-no. She had no business being out in public, according to the law. Everyone she touched became ceremonially, ritually impure, unclean, therefore requiring those people to take a big time out for isolation and cleansing before they could return to normal life. She knew that she was touching people to get to Jesus. Jesus knew she was touching people. She touched Jesus, and Jesus knew this. Aren't you thankful Jesus knows all about it? And and here's the simple lesson we can first learn. Religious rules are meant to be broken. Remember our study in Romans? Religious rules are meant to be broken when they get in the way of helping people when they violate the law of love. Religious rules are meant to be broken. Jesus broke the legalistic rules. And we compare Mark and Matthew's account, the same but different. Matthew reports in chapter 9, verse 27, she said to herself, if only I touch. Now Mark says this, she thought. What do we get from that? So what you say is what you think, and what you think is what you say. I want to say that again. What you say is what you think, and what you think is what you say. Faith, faith, this is a faith-filled action. Faith is an action word. Faith takes action. So we go to Hebrews chapter 11. I'm going to center on verse 6 in just a moment. But this whole chapter, if you remember, this is the chapter of faith. Great examples of faith, the heroes of faith. You begin to read Hebrews chapter 11, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. Say it with me, by faith. By faith. Faith is an action word by faith. Verse 1, faith shows the reality of what we hope for is the evidence of things we cannot see. And that's why I want to say this. We have to see it before we see it. We have to see it with our eyes of faith before we see it with our natural eyes. We need to see it before we see it. How many are with me on that right now? I need to see it before I see it. This woman could see it before she experienced it. She saw it with her eyes of faith before her natural eyes experienced it. She had to see it before she could see it. Faith is an action word. And verse 6 says, and it is impossible to please God without faith. Look at that, by faith, by faith. The Word of God tells us here in 11, so many what we would call the heroes of faith, but you look at that, uh, by faith, Noah believed God and built an ark when the earth had never experienced rain and nobody had ever heard this thing called rain, and he wasn't a boat builder, but 120 years he built the ark and he got into the ark and he sailed away by faith. By faith, there was a man named Moses, and God raised him up to lead the children of Israel out of bondage and slavery for 400 years. It was by faith. By faith, there was a man named Daniel. He went into the lion's den, and he walked out of that lion's den unscathed. By faith, he had friends, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, that went into the fiery furnace, and by faith, they came out. They did not smell like smoke, and they were not singed. By faith, say it with me, by faith. 
By faith there was a Deborah. By faith there was a Rahab. By faith there was Elijah. By faith there was a Samson. By faith there was a Peter. By faith there was a Paul. By faith, this is how we are moving today. We're not living by sight. We're walking and living by faith. I'm going to walk. Amen. We're going to walk through 2024 by faith. We're going to step into 2025 by faith. And then someday I'm going to walk from this life into the next life by faith. Hallelujah. We're living and walking by faith. It says, and it's impossible to please God without faith. And anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely or diligently seek him. God works through faith. God deals in the commodity of faith. God lives in the faith realm. Verse 6, believe that God exists. We need to believe in God. Jesus, faith in Jesus, become Christ followers, have a set of biblical beliefs and values and moral standards, a creed, but we also need to not only believe in Jesus, we need to believe Jesus. How many see the difference, see the difference? It's one thing to believe in him, but do I believe him? He is who he says he is, and he can do what he says he can do. Believe him. So we have deep, convincing convictions. We believe in the existence of a saving, personal, infinite, holy God who cares for us. God cares for you this morning greatly. We believe that God will respond to us and reward us when we sincerely look to him in faith, knowing that above all, our greatest reward is we're going to experience the presence of God in our life. We must diligently pursue a deeper relationship with God and passionately desire his presence and his power and his purpose in our life. It takes faith. We can get hung up thinking, well, I just need more faith. I need more faith. I just need more faith. I'm not going to ask you to tell your neighbor, hey, you need more faith. No, just use, exercise the faith that you have right now. Exercise it. Your faith is going to grow like a muscle. Exercise your faith. What we see here is spiritual. She just didn't touch Jesus, and Jesus didn't simply just touch her. It was a faith-filled action. It was a point of contact. This was a healing touch. Her natural met Jesus supernatural. She was persistent. She wasn't giving up. I got to get to Jesus. Verse 30 through 34, it tells us there, Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out of him. So he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my robe? And his disciples looked at him. Look at this crowd pressing around you, Jesus. How can you ask who touched me? Who touched me? But he kept on looking around to see who had done it. Then the frightened woman, trembling at his feet, at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell on her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. You're suffering is over. What do we see here? He realized he had been touched. He realized that healing power went out of him. And he turned around and says, who touched me? And the disciples are like, are are, are you kidding? Is this a trick question? Another one of those pop quizzes that you do with us all the time, Jesus? Like, uh, do you know what he's talking about, Peter? I don't, I don't, I haven't got a clue here. Mm, No. See, he wasn't, he wasn't arguing with a woman for touching him. He knew she had touched him, but he did this in order to teach her and to teach us something about faith. Jesus said her faith played a huge part in her cure, her faith in Jesus. Genuine faith involves action, action. Faith that isn't put into action isn't faith at all. There was a delay. Who touched me? Jesus knew, but she was afraid. And there it is again, and I call this an ugly word, fear. That's an ugly word, fear. She was afraid to tell the truth about herself. 
when she met Jesus. She was unclean. She had defiled everyone, including Jesus, so she thought. And she thought, just as quickly, maybe as I receive my healing, this quick, I can lose my healing. And she was shaking at Jesus' feet. And and I take away from this portion right here, she was afraid to tell Jesus the truth. I want to tell you this morning, just tell Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. He knows all about it already, and he can handle it. What are you afraid of? Did it turn you away? What would happen if you would tell Jesus this morning the whole truth about what's going on in your life, who you are? He knows it all. He loves you, amen? Do you believe Jesus loves you this morning? Well, if he knew all about me, yes, he knows all about you. You, He knows you better than you know yourself, and he loves you. He accepts you, he saves you, and he can heal you. Then we see Jesus gives her, I I like this. She's healed, just like that. 12 years, suffering, isolation. He gives her a new identity and a new destiny, just like that. He never used this title for anyone else we see in the New Testament, but right here to this woman. She had suffered for 12 long years, a condition for 12 long years. We at times think that she's maybe more of a middle-aged woman, but as I was reading this again this week, there's a thought that she's probably just in her 20s. She's been suffering since puberty with this from an early age. For her, she thought her life was over. Boy, if I would ask you this morning, anybody ever suffered with something for a few years? Anybody ever suffered with an illness for a few years? How many of you get real honest with me? Anybody suffer with an addiction for a few years? Yeah. Not fun. She was suffering. 12 long years until Jesus passed by. Until Jesus passed by. Just like that, she was forgiven, she was saved, she was healed, she was delivered, and she was free. She became a new person in Christ. She was made whole and she was pronounced clean, no longer an outcast. She didn't have a family before. She didn't have friends before, but now she is no longer an outcast. She became a daughter of the Most High God. Somebody say amen. Just like that. Hallelujah. Our God's in the details. He is intentional. You're an outcast, you're lonely, you are at the end of your rope, but I declare to you today that you're forgiven, you're free, you're whole, you're clean. You are my daughter now. You're in my family now. You're a child of the Most High God. And that's the word the Lord has for us today. That as we continue to preach the gospel, as we continue to be salt and light in this community and around the world, that we want to see people Come to know Christ and live in freedom every day. You're a daughter of the Most High God. You're a son of the Most High God. Hallelujah. On Friday, Teresa and I had the privilege of being with uh, uh, Dave and Sheree Dominguez at the Philadelphia Dream Center, and it was uh, the dedication of the women's home. And so we had a luncheon and, and, and a small service, and we heard a testimony of one of the young ladies already in the home there. And then we went outside, and, and uh, I was able to say a few words and pray. And then we had a ribbon-cutting ceremony. And, and I'm going to tell you, we declared over Kensington that there are women that have become the daughters of the Most High God. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. If we don't pray for miracles, and if we don't pray for healing, there's a 100% chance that none will take place. I want you to hear that. Think about this. Man, we Christians, we get into arguments uh, amongst ourselves so much. I was saying this to the men uh, on early Wednesday morning in our prayer time in our study. 
And if you're a guy and you want to show up at 6 o'clock with us Wednesday mornings, join us. We've got strong coffee, and we've got great prayers, and we get into the Word of God, about, about 10, 12 of us, and you're welcome to join us here. But, you know, I, I, I think about that. Sometimes we're just chasing each other like this. Anybody ever have a dog and your dog chases its tail like this? Yeah. We have a dog, and he plays with Teresa's sister's dog, and they'll go in circles and circles in the backyard with each other. And we Christians get into arguments sometimes. And usually it's like this. It's not really so much you don't have enough faith, you have little faith. We've come to the place now where we put people down and criticize them. You've got too much faith. You've got too much faith. You have hyper faith. You have mega faith. You're just out there with those name it and claim it people. And you know what, God? I got to tell you something. I understand what they're saying, but as I've been into the Word of God on this topic, especially lately, I have never, I never, ever see in the Word of God Jesus chastising someone, you have too much faith. You just need to back off a little bit. You're over the top with your faith. Stop believing so much. Somebody say amen. Amen? We never see Jesus saying that. He says you have no faith or little faith. I'm going to say you can't have too much faith. I would rather err on the side of faith than no faith. Amen? I'm going to say that again. I'd rather err on the side of no faith, on too much faith, than no faith. If we don't pray for healing and miracles, there's a 100% chance that none will take place. And here's the last point. Just keep believing. Now we've had this divine interruption, and now we've got to go back to the story. Here's Jairus. He's been standing here the whole time. My little girl is dying. Come on, let's go. This is wonderful. This is great. But yeah, all this is happening. He's in the mob of people. Let's look at verse 35 and 36. While he was still speaking to her, messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. They told him, your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now, but Jesus overheard them and said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just have faith. Don't be afraid, just have faith. Fear will always fight faith. Don't be afraid, just have faith. See, Jairus is getting ready to find out Jesus isn't just a teacher. And he isn't just the greatest of teachers, of all teachers. He's so much more. Don't be afraid. Do not fear or fear not appear 365 times in our Bibles. That tells me I have a fear not or don't be afraid for every day of the year. Amen? Fear will always fight faith every time. Jesus is saying, there's hope. You have a promise. He's going to show once again, he has authority over nature. He has authority over Satan, the fallen angel, and the demons, fallen angels. He has authority over sickness and disease. He has authority over death. Verse 37, then Jesus stopped the crowd, won't let anyone go with him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw much commotion and weeping and wailing. You see, they paid women to be professional mourners. So they would cry more, they would wail more, and they thought if there wasn't proper weeping or wailing, that was disrespect and ultimate disgrace, and they had to bury their dead quickly. And so Jesus, he went inside and asked, why all the commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead. She's only asleep. Yeah. You see, Jesus, he's the life giver. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He is life itself. He has authority over death. And sleep is a metaphor. He's saying this is a temporary condition. He's declaring and assuring Jairus, don't be afraid. I've got this. And I think that's a word for us today. We are living in chaotic times, and I'm, not gonna be, I'm gonna be real short. 
I may say more about this next week, what's going on in our nation and our world. There's an antichrist spirit at work today, and we're not taken by surprise. We're really not because the Bible tells us this is going to happen. So don't be afraid. It's not elephant against the donkey. How many hear me? There's an antichrist evil spirit in the world today of death and destruction and everything unholy and godly. Don't be afraid. God's got this. Amen? Don't be afraid. God's got this. Amen. Don't be afraid what's going on in your life right now. God's got this. You may be hurting. God's got this. You don't know how long it's been, Pastor. I, I probably don't, but God does, and he's got this. He's got this. Financially, you're in a very hard place. God's got this. Verse 40, then the crowd gathered at him, but he made them all leave. I like this. It really, I do. This is, I like so much about these scenarios. He made them leave. You don't have any faith. I'm getting the negative out of here. I'm getting the lack of faith out of here. I need a faith-filled room. You're not allowed in the room right now. Get unbelief out of the room. Amen? That's why when somebody's in a coma, and I've been with many people in a coma, I believe you don't say this, you do say this. Be quiet or say what you need to say, faith-filled, positive things. They can hear what's taking place in that coma. Get the lack of faith out of the room. Then he took the girl's father and mother and his three disciples into the room where the girl was lying. Holding her hand, he said to her in Aramaic, Talitha Kaum. And that is the local language of the day. So they spoke Hebrew, Aramaic, and they spoke Greek, which means little girl, get up. And the girl who was 12 years old immediately stood up, walked around, and they were overwhelmed and totally amazed. Hallelujah. Amen. So... What does it say for us today? I want to encourage you, speak life and not death. Speak to the dead things in your life, those things that have died that you may have given up on this morning. Speak to those godly dreams and desires. Speak to those relationships. Speak to your marriage. Speak to your children. Speak life into your career. Speak life into your business. Speak life into your health. Speak life into your finance. Let's speak life into our nation, the U.S. of A. Let's speak life. Hallelujah. Life conquers death every time. He is Lord of even death. Hallelujah. Verse 43, Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone what happened. And then he told them, and this is what I like about Jesus, and give her something to eat. Yeah, don't tell. You say, well, what's up with that? And I'm wrapping this up. Jesus' greatest mission was in his salvation. You can be born again. Your sins can be forgiven. You can become a daughter or son of the Lord, living life with him and all the way to heaven. See, he wasn't there to empty out the cemeteries, at least not yet. He just wasn't all about miracles. He didn't want the crowds following him for a so-called magic show. And Jesus absolutely proves that he has authority over nature, demons, illness, and death. But what this shows us, see, this is a glimpse that he's authority over death. He is a glimpse of the future that he has for us. One day, say that with me, one day. One day, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. There's going to be the refiner's fire and everything is going to be burned away. And we're going to be living in the new heavens and this new earth. And we think, and when we look back, oh, the Garden of Eden must have been something. We haven't seen anything yet. What's coming for us? Let's get a glimpse of the future that Jesus has for us. One day, it's going to vanish away, and there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. One day, Satan and his demons will be forever eternally doomed into the lake of fire. One day, sickness and death will be no more. Hallelujah. In performing these miracles, this is a glimpse for us of the eternal kingdom of God that he has for us.
I'm not going to take time to read 1 Corinthians 15, but one day, this weak mortal body that is made for this earth is going to put on a spiritual heavenly body like Jesus, and we're going to live forever with Jesus. Amen? Just a glimpse this morning. So here's the action step as the worship team comes out. I should ask you this, first of all. Is this kingdom living in you today? This is a glimpse of the kingdom for us. No sickness, no death, no heartache, no pain, no sorrow, no disappointments, no frustration. Uh, no more waiting. <laughs> but is the kingdom of you have you given your life to Christ? Have you asked Christ to come into your life? So here's the action step. In what area of your life do you need a miracle? In what area of your life do you need Jesus to show up? We're going to sing this song together, a faithful song, believe for it. So let's stand. And then after we sing, if you need to go, God bless you. So glad you're here today. I understand. Go ahead and go. But after we sing this song, if you need Jesus to show up in your life, if you need a touch from the Lord, would you please come? We want to pray for you. If we don't pray for healing or miracles, there's a 100% chance that they won't take place. Wouldn't you like Jesus super to meet your natural this morning? Amen. Let's believe. Let's believe.